Tonight's film offers the chance for all of us to consider elephants for what they truly are, intelligent, caring, and I believe thoughtful creatures. Creatures that are deeply affected by their environment, their families, and their past. It's now clear to me and many others that elephant memories are at least as vivid and powerful as our own. They inform and inspire these giants. This film tried to document these elephants' struggles and their successes as they move forward from a difficult past into a very promising future. There are many people to thank in the making of this film, and I'll introduce a few of them during our discussion afterwards. But for now, please enjoy the show, and I look forward to your questions afterwards. Um, so, okay, let, let me start with you, Joyce, if I could. And if you can help folks understand how the situation in Gorongosa is emblematic of the, the condition of elephants across the continent, as well as how Gorongosa is a unique situation. Well, I mean, you know, the elephants in, in Gorongosa have experienced um, civil conflict and suffered uh, as a consequence. But elephants across Africa right now are are being poached for their ivory. And I don't think elephants really distinguish whether it's wartime or, you know, what's going on. They just know when they're under threat from, from people. And as you all know, in the late 1980s, there was um, you know, a situation where, at least in East Africa, those uh, about 80, 85 percent of the elephants were lost. We are now in a situation uh, across Africa where that upsurge in poaching is happening, happening again. So. Um, that's a way in which um, the elephants of the Gorongosa and elephants elsewhere have, you know, experienced um, something similar. But where Gorongosa is unique right now is that while all this horror is happening out there, Gorongosa has a um, a second chance, and it is very secure compared to so many populations. So um, it's wonderful to see the the possibility ahead for these. Thanks. Uh, Mateus, I have a, a question for you. And for those of you who don't know, Mateus is the park administrator from the government of Mozambique and, and a very thoughtful and important leader for all of the work we're trying to do. Um, and you face many complicated challenges and decisions in the maintenance of the park and the welfare of the communities. So I guess I want to ask, is it difficult for your government to justify setting aside land for a national park, which means you know, farming, logging, hunting, or mining on one million prime acres when rural Mozambicans are challenged with poverty? What does Gorongosa do to help its human neighbors who must share this ecosystem? Thank you, Dave. Uh, I would say first that um, it's not actually um, a big challenge for my government at this stage to assign uh, land for protected areas. Um, I think the events over the, the last few years whereby the government declared new protected areas in Mozambique have been showing this commitment of the government of Mozambique to expand protected areas throughout the country. Uh, we have the example of the recently declared national park at the Kirimbaj in the northern part of Mozambique. And even in Gorongosa, we have, as an instance, uh, the fact that the contour above 700 meters on Mount Gorongosa was recently in 2010 declared by the Council of Ministers part of the park. And this was due to the recognition by the government that there was a need to protect Mount Gorongosa since it's an essential part of the great Gorongosa ecosystem because it's the source of the water to the whole park. So I wouldn't say that uh, it's uh, in this regard that it's a big challenge. Uh, I would also provide the instances uh, in which uh, recognizing the fact that we have this legacy in Mozambique uh, and in Gorongosa in particular where we have people living inside the park, 
We are currently working towards relocating some of these communities. And we do have a strong leadership on the government side. We had uh, the government assigning land to one of these communities that we are relocating. We are relocating 72 families who live in a place that our ecologists regard as being the sanctuary of the elephants. So we are helping them move out of the park and the government assigned land for those uh, who are relocating. So I wouldn't say that it's a natural uh, challenge. And uh, going to the second part of your question, uh, we do recognize that we can't uh, restore a national park as Gorongosa is without looking at the needs of the people who surround the park. So that's why uh, the government of Mozambique is partnering with the Car Foundation in the restoration of the park. So it's a 20-year project in which, apart from the typical uh, restoration of the biodiversity, we are also putting an emphasis on human development. So we are working with the neighboring communities, uh, developing various community development programs uh, in the areas of uh, health, uh, conservation education, uh, better farming practices, and uh, other types of uh, interventions. And uh, job creation is amongst those. I should uh, mention here that uh, as, as a result of the restoration, we are employing now about 400 people, of which above 95% are from the surrounding villages. So this has a natural impact on the people's lives. And again, it's meeting the government's agenda of using the park, using ecotourism as a, a vehicle towards reducing poverty. Thank you. I'm sorry, go Joyce. No, just, I just like pointing. <laughs> just, just quickly. Um, I think you have a, a good point there on downsides. Um, I mean, it is fair to say that poachers are becoming more and more sophisticated in Africa. You're talking about people using night vision equipment and you know <laughs> helicopters and to to kill rhinos and so on. Um, of course, the sounds that I was playing were recorded using special equipment that could pick up the very, very low frequencies. Um, and, well, we did find that that small, that little <laughs> boom box that we had there actually worked. But normally, I play back sounds with a 200-pound speaker, which isn't the kind of thing that your your average poacher is going to have on hand. But, but I think, you know, I think you have a, a, a point. You could call in big males with playing estrus calls. I mean, you'd have to then record those. You'd have to know what you were doing first. But um, I think you have a valid point there. Not, I think not in this particular thing that we're talking about, but in, as a general thing. I think, uh, you know, I wondered about the night vision. I mean, because once once that sort of technology, the, th the thermal technology, once that's, you know, on the power of your cell phone, you could do amazing things at night. Um, you can see all kinds of stuff. It's, it's actually pretty scary if you think about it. Okay, somebody in the back. Have the woman way back there. Um, my question is more toward the elephant sounds again. Um, I know you said you recorded them in Amboseli. Did you have trial runs or anything before this, or was it just like, oh, play the sounds? I didn't really know. <laughs> Oh dear. Um, uh, you know, I, I have been studying elephants for a long time and studying elephant communication, so I have done many playbacks in Amboseli. In the case of, of, of this film, um, you know, some, it is fair to say that when you're making a film, there are a lot of different 
uh, things that you're trying to do. You're trying to 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 make an exciting story. You're trying to um, make an exciting story that also has truth in it. Um, and so, so this was a way of we're thinking it. Here are animals that are afraid of the car. How might we be able to attract the elephants to the car? Is that is that possible to do? And um, in the case of uh, in the case of you know, I've done that before in Amboseli, where you play the sound of a member of the family to the family, and then you get the, the animals coming toward the speaker. But I thought, how am I going to do that to strangers? And that's when we came up with the idea of, of playing this particular call, because I knew it was elephants who needed help, and that because elephants are so um, they're so programmed to help other elephants that maybe we would get them to come, and and that worked. But you know, it is fair to say that part of this was a part of the storytelling. Um, but as a result of this, um, seeing the the response of the animals, we now have a tool that we can we can use perhaps in their conservation. The gentleman in the white. Um, are the programs that you guys used being used in other parks throughout Africa as well? I mean, is this problem uh, widespread past Mozambique, and, and do the similar tactics work with other elephants, or is it, or you know, did it work because those elephants were, you know, uh, prone to, you know, what you guys did? I, I think that there, there are the elephants all across Africa in protected areas um, uh, are, are having similar problems with distrust of people, and I think it's getting something that's becoming more and more and more. One thing that's really um, extraordinary about Gorongosa is that um, through the Gorongosa Restoration Project, through uh, the Carr Foundation, um, through actually Greg Carr's incredible um, idea, um, of protecting this park on, in the long term and creating this private partnership uh, with the uh, Mozambican government, it's a model that could take place in other national parks around Africa. And, and I think it, it's possible it might happen um, soon. So, um, but but these these are the kind of things that could, you know, a lot of these parks in Africa don't have um, the resources to, to protect, you know, the way that Gorongosa does at the moment. And, and in fact, the best thing that anybody can do if they want to help is come and um, come and experience it for yourself. I mean, Gorongosa is a, a great place to start. It's an amazing <laughs> national park. When you come, you will be, you know, among the first people to come there in a long time, and you will have the place to yourself, and it's an extreme, extremely amazing wilderness that you, you will walk away from thinking, God, that was incredible. Agreed. Sir, I'm sorry, I'm making you run up and down. This is like aerobic panel discussion. <laughs> In 1983, I was a tourist in Zimbabwe, and while there, I bought ivory as gifts to bring home. And shortly after I got back, I got a letter from Joyce, which educated me about the market for ivory and how it was encouraging poachers. I'm wondering now, have we made any progress against poachers, raising the level of consciousness about ivory and why not to buy it? Wow, um, <laughs> that's an interesting story. Um, you know, we're into another, an, an, a new era now, um, and this is an era in which um, China has come to play a huge role. Um, there's a, a growing middle class. There's a growing middle class who wants to buy luxury goods, and ivory is one of them. Um, there are a lot of Chinese uh, across Africa involved in development projects. And quite honestly, there is basically a kind of um, you know ivory syndicates are, are growing across Africa. Um, my personal feeling is that when the ban went into effect in 1989, we had a chance to really close down this trade, but um, 
it was kind of opened up. A little window was opened up by several um, sales of stockpiles uh, from a couple of countries in, in southern Africa, and that rekindled um, the ivory carvers, it rekindled the market, it sent a message in the Far East that it was okay to buy ivory again. And I tell you, it's just out of control right now. We're losing elephants even in the most protected parks like the Masai Mara, Samburu, Amboseli. Um, so it's scary and it's hard to know now how we're going to put the lid on it. Sir, yeah, not too bad a run this time. You've touched base on the topic I've been waiting to ask about, which is the, the ivory trade. What what can we in this room do? I mean, we've seen recently political, um, you know, run countries turned over with social media. So when the lights dim, we turn our phones back on. What can we do? Um, thank you for that. I seem to be hogging the. I'm sorry about this. Um, uh, yeah, I think you. I think you have a very good point with the social media because we we need to reach across the globe right now. Because yes, you know, yes, there is buying of ivory in the United States. Yes, there's illegal ivory coming in here, but right now it is the Far East, and and we need to. Anyone in this room who um, can speak Chinese has a network in China or in the Far East. I think you know, <laughs> get out there. There and and spread the word. And I think we have to pull together as a global community and, and get the message out there. We have to reduce the demand. I have to say, before we did this project, Bob and I were in Kenya on a different project working with Chinese conservation officials who are coming to Kenya for the first time to familiarize themselves with the issues surrounding poaching and the issues surrounding the increasing demand coming from their more affluent consumer base, let's call it, the raised, growing middle class. And one of the surprising things that came out of that time was we learned that there are large portions of the Chinese uh, market who are consuming ivory or buy, purchasing ivory don't understand that buying ivory means killing an elephant. It's not a tooth extraction. And that's a, a remarkable you know, piece of knowledge and awareness raising we have to do. And social media would be one dramatic way to accomplish that. Joyce, the world owes you a debt of gratitude for your tireless advocacy for elephants for your, your whole life's work, so thank you for that. And I also wanted to ask if you could talk about um, the challenges to elephants who have had their elders taken out and what, uh, with respect to um, uh, time, habitat, elephant personality um, helps with with an elephant family becoming functional again who has had their elders removed that's maybe a tough question but I think that elephants are are remarkably flexible I mean like us they, they are capable of being horribly scarred but they're also capable of, of recovery and given given friends and family even if the family is not their own family given other elephants and given a safe place um, you know elephants reach out to each other just as as we do and um, they certainly can can recover. Absolutely. I mean, we saw it happening out there. It was the orphans that were leading these families, and they didn't have the parental skill set imbued in them because their parents had been wiped out when they were young. So there was a resilience to the species we saw taking place when we were there. So that's a hopeful sign. Um, I hope this is not a silly question, but I, I heard a game warden suggest this on television because I know they just lost another 500 elephants uh, in South Africa poaching for ivory. I'm not an elephant expert and I bow before your wisdom, but this man suggested shooting the elephants with a tranquilizer, amputating the tusks, burning, burning the tusks so that they're not in the market. Then you have tusk-free, tuskless elephants no longer. They seem able to survive with either no tusks or little tusks. Because they're, 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 I mean, they just lost another 500 for the tusk, for the tusks. So does that make any sense at all? You know, tranquilize them, amputate the tusks, burn them. The elephants are no longer desirable. 
I, there may be a little confusion on countries and it's probably Cameroon you're talking about and there may be rhino horn but on elephants the trouble is these are teeth they have a nerve um, you can't just take the, the tusk out you can cut it off um, at a certain level but there's still a lot of ivory left in and it continues to grow Oh, I see. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount that's inside that we don't see. I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a huge amount. The nerve is about that big. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the gentleman in the back's been very patient. I'm sorry. Straight, straight back. Thank you for all the work you are doing. Um, uh, uh, and just qu three quick questions. First of all, uh, is, is South Africa pursuing a relatively humane or good policy towards the elephant population? Because that's where I've seen elephants myself. And uh, second of all, uh, their, their memory of natural disasters, how does that impact on them? Has that reduced their population? As I seem to remember the, national, the, the, the natural disasters of a while back. Um, are really affecting the, or really affecting that area. And last but not least, can you play music and will that classical music will that calm them down? Or am I just being ridiculous? <laughs> I asked her to play Freebird over and over. But, uh... <laughs> um, uh, yes, um, South Africa. You know, in years past, South Africa had a regular, regular culling program, and I do believe they are considering culling again, but there have been many years without any culling, and certainly now the country is working very hard to avoid any culling, and I think, I think they're doing a, a, a great job in, in protecting uh, their elephants. Um, on the playing of classical music, I um, I used to sing to the elephants. I used to sing Amazing Grace to the elephants and they used to gather around the car and I have also had a friend play the guitar to the elephants, had them come up and I was out with Ruichi Sakamoto playing on the keyboard and had elephants come up to the car. So elephants do enjoy classical music. Um, I have seen them uh, during uh, one night uh, New Year's Eve. Freebird. Huh? No freebird. <laughs> yeah, you too. Um, um, yeah, one night uh, New Year's Eve at the lodge and uh, really dancing up a storm and looking out through the shadows and seeing a group of elephants tuskless and co watching all of us. So I, I do think elephants like music. <laughs> Anybody in the middle? Yeah, right in, in the center. Are you content to feel that you have spent enough time there doing this uh, for it to have a continued effect? And if not, uh, do you have plans to go back or are there, there are others who will continue your work? I just have to say, once you go to Gorongosa, you're not content. We're, we're, we're very excited that this is just the beginning of a, of a, a fantastic uh, project that, uh, you know, the goal will be to po a positive ID every uh, member of that population and um, give them the time that they need to, to be completely relaxed around people. So, um, no, it's just the beginning. Thank you for making this possible. It's been wonderful. Um, I wanted to have you explain the difference between the tuskless and the tusk elephants. You said most of what was left did not have tusks and hence had not been killed for the ivory. Is it a function of age that the tusks grow or male versus female? or? Okay. Um, no, uh, genetically there are just some elephants that don't have tusks. Um, like some people go bald or um, need Thanks, glasses. Boss. Really appreciate uh, it. Sorry. <laughs> You'll never work in this town but, again. <laughs> but um, but uh, you know, the, 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 there's a disproportionate number of tuskless elephants in Gorongosa because the elephants that were there that had tusks were killed. So, yeah, so they, now, the, the young elephants coming up, of course, they're, 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 
mothers and fathers have a, gen have a gene in there for tusks. So the young ones coming will have tusks again. It's, yeah. Ooh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I see lots of young elephants with tusks. <laughs> No, I mean, of course, if your mother has no tusks and your father has tusks, then there is a high chance that you will also be tuskless, but there's also a chance that you'll have tusks, yeah. So there will be a higher proportion of tusklessness in this population from now on, um, but there will be a higher proportion of tusked elephants in the next generation than among the survivors because they were not killed because they didn't have tusks. I just want you guys to know before the last question that this that was that was a knockdown drag out for these guys. That's as bad as it gets. So that is a tribute to Bob and Joyce's mom who is here tonight. Yeah, I wanna say there she is. she had to put up with. <laughs> the, the kid who broke And it. our sister is there, too. Okay. Um, but that also, look, this is a little opportunity to say thank you to, we have spouses of the three of us, anyway, who are here tonight, who put up with the crazy travel that we do. So I want to say, I love you to my wife, Julie, and my son, Will. And I love I you, Gina love Poole. You. <laughs> Pet or I like you a lot. <laughs> so thank you to you guys. Um, okay, last question. One last run. So I was lucky enough to visit Gorongosa in December, and while I wasn't able to see any elephants then, I did see uh, lost, Africa's Lost Eden, and I saw the work that Gorongosa is doing to bring elephants from other places in Africa, and I wanted to ask Mateus, what are the plans for Gorongosa in terms of re reintroducing other animals and kind of how to manage the park going forward. Oh, first of all, thank you for, for visiting us. And secondly, I would like to say that um, with regards to elephants, we've done some uh, reintroductions and specifically targeting uh, elephants with tusks. So we brought some from South Africa, from Kruger specifically. There were six in total, the ones you saw in the film. Unfortunately, two of them died in different circumstances. One was poached, and the other one did not survive to her, um, at the process of translocating it back to the park after leaving the park for about 10 days. So we do have uh, younger males that were introduced and we hope that this uh, characteristic, the tasks will be brought in to the existing population with their contribution. Uh, regarding other species, yes, we did uh, introduce uh, buffalo. Uh, we brought in um, wildebeest and the plants are to continue bringing uh, especially the bulk grazers because this is one of the main challenges that the park is facing because of the lack of those uh, we are having uh, ecological problems that include the uh, encroachment of trees and uh, so we are looking now at uh, putting emphasis on, on buffalo, uh, on zebra, and also on, on hippos. So be a pioneer, go to Gorongosa, you will love it. And thank you panelists, and thank you friends. Thanks for coming.